So today what I wanted to talk to you all about is uh, tasks involving complex reasoning and why I think natural language is the right way to address them. Um, so to kind of start off and motivate uh, where I'm going to be coming from in this talk, um, I'm going to start with the task of textual entailment. So um, with the popularity of benchmarks like Blue, we've seen this task a lot lately. Um, we have a premise like a dog is chasing a cat and a hypothesis like two animals are running. And a pre-trained transformer model, if you fine tune it on suitable data, can correctly judge that um, you know, this first hypothesis is entailed by the premise and the second hypothesis is contradicted by the premise. So when I talk about complex reasoning, I would argue that entailment is a task that involves systematic reasoning. And in this case, there's reasoning going on, but it's purely latent, right? It's all happening inside these transformer models. But if you try out some different examples, you'll find some kind of slightly systematic behavior, like, um, you know, the model seems to figure out that something chasing means that that thing is probably running. Okay, but there's been a lot of discussion about failures in these models. And so, um, you know, you can find one like this. Um, three animals are running, the model incorrectly decides that this is entailed, even though we don't know if there's a third animal there. And so when these models go wrong, it's really hard to diagnose. And one of my favorite examples of this uh, is the case of uh, multi-hop reasoning, particularly the hot pot QA data set. Um, so my student, Jifan, um, along with a few others at the time, kind of all independently found out that uh, basically some of the models that we thought were doing multi-hop reasoning and learning to combine multiple facts were actually just answering these uh, questions in a single hop way and getting reasonably good performance by doing so. And the only reason this was surprising was because this was all happening inside neural nets and so we couldn't see what was going on. All right, so we can try to improve these latent reasoning models by doing things like constructing better data sets, by uh, using deep biasing techniques to try to learn, um, you know, better, uh, to try to avoid learning spurious correlations in the input data, um, by using techniques like contrastive learning. But I'd argue that this is ultimately doomed to fail. So here's an example from the natural questions data set. What age do you need to be to buy a BB gun? And here's the gold annotated answer from Wikipedia. In Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Ontario, British Columbia, and Quebec, the minimum age to purchase an airsoft gun is 18. So two things about this context. First is that it only applies to Canada. Uh, so I'll give a plug here for some work that I'm not involved in, um, but Michael Zhang and Unsel Choi uh, from UT have this nice new data set um, pairing questions with extra linguistic contexts like spatial and temporal contexts that might change the answers to that question. So um, that's a very nice paper data set called Situated QA. The other thing in this uh, example is that the, uh, the context says airsoft gun and the question says BB gun. Are these the same things? It's a little bit complicated, actually. So I would argue that an end-to-end -end model, regardless of what number it spits out here, whether it's 18 or some other age, you know, I'm going to want a little bit more reasoning before I go and try to buy a gun and break the law here. So I want to see end-to-end -end reasoning, uh, or I want to see some reasoning out of this model in, in addition to just the kind of answer given from an end-to-end -end model. So let me show you a kind of alternative vision of what doing more reasoning might look like. Um, and here we're going to go back to that entailment example, and we're going to try to look at it through the lens of a theorem prover. So one way we could tackle entailment would be to convert uh, these sentences into some kind of semantic representation, and then have some collection of rules, inference rules, that allow us to prove the uh, hypothesis from the premise. So this is great if you can make it work. Um, it allows us to articulate a set of intermediate reasoning states and kind of construct a proof going uh, through the steps establishing this entailment relation. However, the disadvantage is basically everything else. It requires a high coverage semantic formalism that can represent everything we need. It requires parsing in that formalism and it requires these rules that are really hard to learn from data. Here's the paradigm that I'm going to talk about in this talk that's going to try to get at the best of both worlds. We're going to leverage pre-trained models and try to do reasoning directly in natural language, but we're going to try to establish intermediate conclusions along the way. 
And what this is going to let us do is it's going to let us see a kind of chain of reasoning all the way from our input evidence to whatever the final decision we're trying to make is, whether it's a kind of claim that we're checking or a question that we're answering or whatever. So these, this, this model is ideally going to be able to combine logical inference with lexical inference, capturing things like paraphrasing that uh, pre-trained language models are really good at. And so in terms of where this kind of sits with respect to prior work, um, you know, I've, I've shown a kind of continuum here where on the left we have approaches that are very kind of ontologically grounded, things like natural logic that really rely on um, things like hypernymy relationships between words in order to uh, do this kind of reasoning, but they do operate directly over natural language. So we're going to try to be a little bit more broad coverage than that. Um, and on the right here, I have uh, kind of the kind of current trendiest approach, which is to just do everything with an end-to-end -end, uh, generation model like GPT-3. Um, so especially with uh, the release of Palm, what last week or two weeks ago, um, we've seen uh, this kind of growth of interest in these sort of so-called chain of thought models, which generate a uh, textual explanation as they're arriving at the answer. So the approach I'm going to talk about here is going to try to be a little bit more grounded in, in reasoning than that. Um, and I'll describe that when I, uh, you know, more at the end of the talk. Okay, why should we do this in natural language? So the first is that text is a very expressive semantic representation. It was very easy for me to write down uh, this explanation of this entailment decision at the top of the slide. It's flexible. It allows us to combine pre-trained models with knowledge, common sense knowledge bases with things like Wikipedia, et cetera, because these are all expressed in language. And then of course, because it's a natural language, it's very easy for users to look at the reasoning chains that come out and understand them. The main challenge is having data for this and being able to make sure that our models are reasoning soundly. So these are gonna be big evaluation points that we're gonna look at in the projects throughout this talk. Um, and so that brings me to my outline of what I'm going to talk about. So uh, the talk's mostly going to focus on these first two pieces of work, which are going to be about verifying the outputs of QA models and also about this idea of taking multiple statements and kind of combining them together in this deductive reasoning framework. Um, and at the end, um, I'm going to just briefly touch on uh, some uh, recent work on improving uh, generation and, and uh, a new way of uh, generating diverse outputs from generation models, which I think as we start to employ generation models for this kind of reasoning is the kind of thing that's going to be important. Okay, so let me dive into the first project here, uh, which was work led by my student Jifan Chen, um, joint with Ansel Choi, uh, and it, this tackles using textual entailment systems to figure out whether the outputs of QA models are correct or not. So an example of what that looks like is this. Uh, so we have a question like who plays the bad guy in the good place? And we have a passage extracted, let's say you used either the kind of gold annotated paragraph in Wikipedia or one of these like reader retriever um, setups where uh, we retrieve this using, you know, some kind of dense retrieval model. What we want to do is we want to take the output from this base model, which I just listed Roberta QA, but it can be whatever, just some latent reasoning model and check the answer. So why do we want to go back and check the answer post hoc? One reason is that it might help us figure out if this question was really unanswerable, but the QA answer kind of returned a best effort answer anyway. Um, we can also try to get better confidence in uh, the outputs that we give, or we could do things like validate presuppositions in the question. There's a few different um, reasons we might want to do this. Okay, so let me show you how we manipulate the natural language here in order to do this kind of reasoning. So first we take the question and the proposed answer, and we put them through a question to statement conversion model. Um, this is a T5 3 billion model trained on data from Dora Dembski et al. And what it outputs in this case is Ted Danson plays the bad guy in the good place. In this case, a very easy uh, kind of syntactic transformation of the inputs, but there are more complex cases. All right, that forms what I'm going to suggestively call a hypothesis. Then we have this retrieved context from Wikipedia, 
And we're going to apply a model called decontextualization, which is also based on a T5 seek to seek model. Um, and this was work that Unsel and her collaborators uh, at Google did. And the idea here is to make the context of this answer stand alone. So for example, we do things like anaphora resolution or replacing the series with the series, the good place. So it's kind of fully specified. Now we have this standalone statement. And now we can take an entailment model and say, does the hypothesis really follow from this context that was retrieved? So even though the QA system returned it, is it really the answer? And in this case, the NLI model is going to say no. It turns out the model is right for the wrong reasons in this case. Um, there's nothing about Ted Danson being the bad guy here. Okay, so just to recap that, we have a QA model that's gonna propose an answer. This is just whatever QA model you want. Then we're going to put it through our verifier model, which was what we studied in this work, um, which has these two conversion models and this NLI model, and it's gonna give us a confidence value based on the probability of entailment. And then that's gonna allow us to reject answers that are low confidence. So I'm gonna show you two things you can do with this model. The first is a kind of warm up experiment. We trained a QA system on squad 1.1. So it's gonna answer every question that it's given. And then we run it on squad two, which contains unanswerable questions. And we wanna use our verifier to reject the answers that are bad. So if we use a Roberta MNLI model and these two other uh, kind of ask pieces of that conversion pipeline, we can get about 80% uh, accuracy at this task. We can reject most of the unanswerable questions and accept most of the ones where the answers are correct. So uh, let me emphasize, this is not advancing the state of the art on squad or anything like that, but I still think it's a cool result because this NLI model is not trained on squad at all. Um, and in fact, none of this pipeline was kind of optimized end to end, right? Um, we put this together from these pre-existing components and we found that it actually has some merit for QA. Um, and one very important factor is that uh, because we're able to form this single sentence premise, we can use the MNLI model off the shelf rather than having to try to use one of these new document level NLI uh, methods, which I think are uh, a little bit harder to reason about and harder to build good models for. Okay, so then the main results that we uh, looked at in this paper were about transfer to new settings and trying to answer questions only where we're confident that the model is correct. So we trained a model on natural questions and we ran it on natural questions and four other out of domain data sets. And so what we wanted to study here was whether we could achieve good accuracy at low coverage. So basically, if the model is allowed to only answer 30% of the questions it's given, how high can we get the accuracy? Um, so in orange here, what we're doing is we are ranking the questions basically by how competent the base QA system is. And in green here, we have the uh, ranking according to our verifier. So our verifier that lets us answer a different subset of questions. And in fact, the, when it returns, it wants us to return answers, the answers are more likely to be correct. So for example, at 10% coverage, uh, the QA model uh, alone is getting around 85 F1 um, and our model is getting over 90 F1. Um, so there's one other little detail here, which is that we trained this on both MNLI and also natural questions converted to an NLI data set, which we can do using our framework. Um, but because the QA models trained on NLI, uh, MN, or, sorry, trained on natural questions as well, this doesn't introduce any additional, um, you know, this doesn't introduce any additional data. So I think beyond the results, I, I want to kind of emphasize what we sort of learned and saw from this pipeline. Um, so the first thing, which I think is really cool, is that despite using this QA conversion in these decontextualization models, they actually didn't make very many errors because we're using big models for them. And uh, this kind of natural language manipulation is the kind of thing that these models are really good at. So obviously most of the errors were in things like uh, the entailment step. However, the kind of interesting thing that we saw was a lot of times the, they were spotting errors in the underlying QA data set. So let me give you an example of that. We have a uh, reformulated question and answer. John von Neumann developed the central processing unit. 
Uh, and then we're checking that against the following context. On June 30th, 1945, before any act was made, mathematician John von Neumann distributed the first uh, the paper entitled First Draft of a, of a Report on the EDVAC. It was the outline of a stored program computer, blah, blah, blah. There's nothing here about John von Neumann developing the CPU. And so even though it's marked as the gold answer, the NLI model disagrees. And I think what this allows us to say is it allows us to really say, okay, is this context actually enough to support this answer? Even though this was annotated as gold in the data set, does that does it actually kind of like hit the bar that we would like to hit? And um, in my opinion, no. I mean, I think if I asked, if I typed this question into a search engine and got this answer, I wouldn't be fully satisfied that um, I was seeing the right answer here. Okay, so let me kind of conclude this first part of the talk, which is that we showed that we can do this kind of manipulation of text here, these contexts as well as question and answer pairs, and then plug them into this NLI model to check answers. And so this allows us to leverage this kind of off the these off the shelf tools for reasoning to do better at uh, kind of both figuring out whether when our models are correct and also when our data sets are correct. Um, and so I think this has really exciting potential for allowing us to do things like uh, figure out, well, okay, when the answer is wrong, can we explain the prediction of the NLI model and figure out, you know, why exactly, uh, you know, it doesn't support uh, the answer that was given or kind of construct an even more detailed explanation of why it answers the question. Um, so I think this paves the way for towards systems that do an even better job of kind of addressing a user's information need and giving them what they want. All right, Can I'll pause here. Question? Yeah, go for it. I was just about to yeah, pause. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, 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 Greg. Very nice. Uh, so, sorry, oh, I joined a few minutes late, uh, sorry, a bit late. So, I, I, can you go back to the decontextualization? I didn't get that part for some reason. Sorry. Decontextualization uh, method. Uh, yeah. So, can you explain that again? Yeah, sure. So, um, so yeah, there's a paper from Unsel and co authors from Google. So, what they do, what they did is, I, uh, they labeled a kind of, kind of medium-sized corpus of data where what they did is they went through and made the sentence stand on its own. So a lot of this is like anaphora resolution or handling things like ellipsis. Um, mm -hmm. You're just kind of filling in details from the context. So um, actually the inputs to this, which is not totally clear from the slide, is this sentence and also everything that comes before it in the text. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then the output is just basically that sentence, but rewritten to have these transformations applied. So there's like five or six different things that they see, um, you know, as kind of common transformations to make stuff stand alone. Uh, I, I see. Uh, but, but one question I always have for, for this line of work, uh, which goes back to the maybe even earlier slides, is that you, you're trying to replace the proof uh, provers or natural logic or whatever, formal logic, by natural natural sentence, kind of natural language kind of serum provers, like using natural language as, as, as if they were logic, right? So of course you have more broader coverage, uh, but uh, but you got a problem with, with ambiguity, right? Because because logic doesn't have ambiguity and you have ambiguity in natural language sentences. So how would you, so maybe sometimes it was due to the ambiguity that you, you got the mean tell me wrong or, or what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, so, uh... I mean, so I guess what I would say is that like, uh, I don't think there's gonna be an easy way. Like, I don't think we can take text which is fundamentally ambiguous and like just translate it into logic and, and do stuff with it, right? So I think if we wanna handle these real world problems, we need to engage with the fact that it is messy and like you, like you do need to kind of grapple with ambiguity and stuff like that. I mean, I think the question is, are we getting kind of more errors introduced through this kind of manipulation? And the answer was basically no here, where this decontextualization was pretty reliable. This mm -hmm. question to statement conversion was pretty reliable. And then NLI models also are stuff are things that even though they have these biases and they have these failure modes, they're very well studied. So I think mm -hmm. that by kind of reducing something like natural questions to NLI, we can actually do a better job at uh, kind of making sure that our reasoning is sound because we like because we've translated it into this problem that we have a really good understanding of whereas the kind of natural questions data set is very noisy and so when you train a model on it kind of who knows what it's going to do i don't know if that directly answered your question yeah yeah, yeah. thank you uh, so so uh, and your nli model uh, which you use for this task 
does it output a kind of a pr kind of proof tree or, or, or this kind of thing that you showed on previous slides that kind of looked like a pr proof tree, uh, like it's explainable uh, explanation why this entails the hypothesis? Yeah, so we don't have an explainable version of the NLI model plugged in yet. Um, that's something that yeah. we'd like to do. I mean, right now, the kind of proof is basically what's being shown here. It just involves these two operations. In the next part of the talk, I'll talk about something which looks a lot more like that, uh, like that other piece that I showed. Um, and, you know, we, we haven't put those all put everything together yet, but I think it'll make sense where that piece fits in. Yeah, thank you so much. Yep, thank you for the questions. Okay, any other questions on this part before I move on? Okay, so let me talk about the second uh, part of this work now, um, which uh, was work led by my student Kai Bostrom, uh, joint with Lucy Zhao, uh, Zane Sprague, and Swarat Chowdhury. And this is gonna deal with uh, basically taking statements and doing logical deduction based on them, but again, in the space of natural language statements. So, we call this task natural language deduction. And basically what we wanna do is we wanna take two statements like apples belong to the tree fruits and the produce of fruit trees can be eaten. And we want to place a distribution over the set of valid and useful conclusions. Um, and so the reason I'm saying useful here is because there's many valid conclusions. For example, apples belong to the tree fruits. You could just repeat that, um, but it somehow doesn't help us conclude anything new. So instead, we would like to be able to conclude things by combining these two statements together in a meaningful way. Uh, so there's two big challenges here. Um, can we get a lot of data for this? Um, because that's the kind of thing that we would need to train a model like BART or T5 or whatever to do this task. And second, if we can do this for one step, can we actually chain these together and start to make uh, kind of useful inferences? Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the sort of first half of that, which is the data set part, which corresponds to our EMNLP work. Uh, so basically, this kind of inference involves two processes, really. There's a kind of logical inference piece where we have to learn these sort of patterns like, uh, you know, things of X have property Y, things of Z are of type X, therefore things of Z have property Y. And so the fact that I kind of said that in a very abstract way suggests that this does, it doesn't really matter what the kind of specific words here. This is a very general kind of logical principle. And we want to combine that with lexical inference or kind of paraphrasing. So for example, on the previous slide, we saw this uh, apples can, apples are edible, um, but the produce of fruit trees can be eaten. So how do we know that those are the same thing? This is the kind of thing that's really hard to do with formal semantic representations of language. Um, it's just really hard to get uh, representations that show that those are the same thing. But of course, pre-trained models are pretty good at recognizing this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come up with a way to generate data in a kind of pseudo template based way, which I'll show in a second. And then we're going to use data augmentation via paraphrasing to get these kind of lexical inferences into the data so that the model can learn them. Okay. so. Our data generation procedure is we are going to start with Wikipedia and we're going to scrape a bunch of sentences that are going to illustrate the kinds of inferences that we want to make. Then we're going to apply this paraphrasing augmentation. Okay, so what we do, and, and this is the kind of key insight that makes this work, is we designed a number of Hearst patterns that capture the kinds of reasoning that we want to be able, the kinds of inferences that we want to make and the kinds of reasoning that we want to be able to do. So for example, uh, this is an example of one of our patterns. Plural nouns such as, you know, blank, do, blank. And this matches sentences like the following. The fertile basins, such as the large thuringian basin, are in intensive use for growing fruits and vegetables. Now, I argue that this actually represents the kinds of inferences that we want the model to be able to do. Um, because we can rewrite it as follows. We can just take a basically subset of the sentence, which is the fertile basins are in intensive use for growing fruits and vegetables. And then we can also use this Hearst pattern, which tells us that basically through this X such as Y pattern, that we know that Y, the large thuringian basin, is an X, is a fertile basin. And so 
then we can essentially using just some syntactic transformations, unroll this as follows. And now we have an example of the kind of deduction that we want to make. These two statements combine um, to yield the large thuringian basin is an intensive use for growing fruits and vegetables. That's our conclusion here. Okay, so then, like I said, we apply data augmentation through paraphrasing. And so what we do is we paraphrase the two premises that are the input to this. And so when we do that using a pre-trained model, here are the outputs we get. Growing fruits and vegetables requires a lot of fertile basins. It's a little bit shaky as a paraphrase. Um, and the thuringian basin is fertile. So this definitely introduces some noise in the data. However, what we found is that like a lot of data augmentation, it basically makes the model kind of robust to some slightly noisy inputs, but it doesn't fundamentally damage the soundness of the reasoning that the model does. Um, and this is all determined empirically, you know, this model is completely capable of, of going off the rails. Um, and so the question is basically, does it go off the rails and, uh, you know, generate weird stuff in practice or does it basically work? So we trained a BART model on around 100,000 examples of this that we scraped from Wikipedia. And let me just start by showing you a couple examples of the kinds of things this model can do, um, which go you know, beyond the kind of patterns that we showed it. Um, so here are two sentences. Uh, doctors use medical tests to diagnose diseases and guide treatment. And some of the most common diagnostic procedures include blood counts and other multi-factor panels. So if we use a version of our model that that's trained on data that doesn't include any of the paraphrasing, it'll just repeat the first premise. It, that's a fairly common failure mode we see in this. It just doesn't know what to do and ends up repeating itself. Um, when we use the full model, it can successfully unify this diagnose frame with this diagnostic procedures noun phrase. And it yields doctors use blood counts and other multi-factor panels to diagnose diseases and guide treatment. Okay. Uh, here's another example where it can recognize that humans building homes causes an ecosystem to change, and then humans changing an ecosystem, um, it's basically able to recognize that causes X then yields the effects of X. Okay, so these examples were taken from a data set from Tushar Kot et al. Uh, from AI2 called Question Answering Through Sentence Composition. And what we did is we did a manual evaluation of our model's ability to make inferences on uh, this data set, which consists of kind of stapling two sentences together like we just saw. So compared to uh, a model that's trained in domain on this data, which is the rightmost column here, we found that our model is able to generate valid inferences just as frequently, basically. Um, which is cool because our model was trained on data scraped from Wikipedia. And so it didn't actually see any of the in-domain data, but still manages to um, you know, do a pretty good job at this data set. Um, and one of the nice things, which I'll come back to in a little bit, is that when it makes mistakes, usually what it does is it just repeats one of the premises, which is at least not wrong. So it's able to basically kind of say something true, even though it's not useful. Um, and that's better than just kind of generating something crazy. Okay, so that gives us what we call our step model, which is going to take two statements and generate a conclusion. And so now we can return to this goal that I established earlier in the talk of being able to take pieces of evidence and generate these intermediate conclusions. So what we'd like to do is be able to kind of apply operations, uh, you know, like this kind of deduction to get the conclusions that we need to address either a claim or a question. So the thing that's interesting and challenging about this problem is that it's a very complex search problem with intermediate states being statements in natural language, right? Um, so it's not just looking at a simple graph over statements or something like that, or paths in a graph, it's actually reasoning about uh, the kind of space of all sentences or grammatical sentences or kind of true sentences, however you want to view it. So let me show you the, the kind of, uh, you know, an example of the kind of thing that we're tackling here. Um, and this is uh, work from Kai's latest archive paper. Um, the kinds of examples, this is a bit simplified for the slide, but um, you have a collection of premises and then a hypothesis that we want to uh, kind of check. Uh, and so 
what we want to do is we want to be able to prove this hypothesis deductively. So we want to be able to put together these sentences like conclude from you know, paper is recyclable and cardstock is a type of paper that cardstock is recyclable. Um, you know, we want to kind of do that repeatedly in order to uh, kind of construct a tree leading to the hypothesis. So this corresponds to a search problem where we have pairs of sentences that we can possibly put together. Um, you know, in general, we can put together larger numbers of sentences as well. But, you know, for this work, we just restricted our attention to pairs. Um, and so we have a search frontier of pairs that we can possibly combine. And some of these pairs are better than others. So in this case, there's meaningful inferences you can get by combining the first and the last statement, basically inferring that cardstock has this property of being recyclable. And then the first and second statement, we can recognize what recyclable means, essentially. Um, but from the second and third statement, there's not a whole lot we can conclude from um, trying to apply deduction to them. So we experimented with a number of heuristics, which you can uh, read about more in our paper. But the thing that worked best was having a learned model that basically evaluates how well we can, or uh, essentially, if we combine two statements, how likely they are to lead to a, uh, to, to be on a kind of tree leading to the hypothesis. And this was learned on um, a supervised data set called Entailment Bank. Um, that was uh, kind of annotated by folks at AI2 around the same, same time as we were doing the uh, data collection stuff in the first part of this uh, section. So the kind of very, the key thing about this model is that we've decoupled the search process of basically knowing what to combine with the actual deduction piece of taking two statements and combining them. Um, and we're going to see when we compare to a baseline that that's going to save us from kind of cheating in a weird way that the, the baseline uh, fully end-to-end -end models tend to, to cheat. Okay, so again, the kind of thing we want to do is recognize, okay, we should combine the first and last statements here, get this sentence, cardstock is recyclable, combine that with S2 here, um, and then produce a statement like this. And then we can use an NLI model to judge, okay, did we actually kind of prove the hypothesis yet. And uh, you know, we kind of put together an NLI model that can do a pretty good job at this. Okay, so our evaluation setup considers examples that are a little bit more sophisticated than what we've seen here. Um, so we have some premises and then also a bunch of distractors. And so this was a uh, kind of setting introduced in this entailment bank data set where um, basically imagine that the distractors were some other relevant facts that were also retrieved from a uh, kind of IR model or some kind of dense retrieval model. So you have a bunch of kind of related facts in the domain. Um, and what we want to do is we want to construct a proof of this true statement uh, shown at the top here. And we want to avoid constructing proofs of false statements. So we're also going to show the model false statements and hope that it kind of fails to prove them. So the way we're going to evaluate this is through a kind of precision recall curve, um, where on the x-axis here, we have the recall of the true statements. Um, so basically, how many statements were we able to, how many of the true statements were able to prove? And then the y-axis is precision. Of the things that we proved, how many of them were true? So uh, in orange here is our model from, uh, you know, that, that I've been showing here, which uses this goal conditioned heuristic. Um, and you can see that it can prove about 60% of the true statements before it really starts to kind of, you know, make any kind of significant number of mistakes and then, you know, kind of tapers off and, and starts to lose precision. So we compared against a pure end-to-end -end T5 model, which spits out a sequence of statements uh, and then at the end basically produces the hypothesis. And the, what we did is we took a prob, kind of probability threshold uh, of the output in order to uh, classify this, the, you know, the, the generations as either, uh, you know, the, the hypotheses as either true or false. But what this model tends to do is it tends to really, it tends to jump to hypotheses that aren't uh, necessarily supported by the evidence that's given. So basically, this end-to-end T5 model has kind of shown everything. It's shown the evidence and the hypotheses, but it doesn't necessarily put together sound proofs. So our model, again, kind of decouples this search procedure with this actual deduction, and that, that 
helps. And how much does it help? Well, we looked at also beyond just our ability to prove things, the individual steps along those proofs that led there. Um, and so this uh, this end to end model gets around 55% uh, according to human judgments of whether you know combining two statements was uh, kind of sound or not. Um, and our full model got 76% uh, accuracy. So you might ask, well, okay, it's 76, you know, can we really trust the outputs of your model? Um, and I think the answer is maybe. Um, so I think there is an, there are a number of interesting cases in this kind of gray area where um, here's what the model generated. So we combined as the amount of oxygen exposed to a fire increases, the fire will burn longer. And if something is left out in the open, then that something is exposed to oxygen. And the model produces this output, the fire will burn longer when that something is left out in the open. So I think if you're an optimist about these models, you say, okay, well, this basically captured the right thing. I think if you're a pessimist, you say, okay, well, the model didn't actually recognize that that something kind of refers to the object that's burning here. And so, you know, did the model actually kind of, you know, understand what was going on here and generate this correctly? Or did it just kind of like manage to hack these two sentences together in a reasonable way? So I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, great. Yeah, this, uh, out of curiosity, so the 55% is reported in, in that guy's paper, the DA? Uh, no, this is this was our um, our evaluation based on uh, running their system. Um, yeah, the, 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 Dalvi, the Dalvi et al. paper, um, I mean, they show some results on, on basically constructing these proofs, but they don't do a lot of, of study of the kind of validity of what's there. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah, I'm just curious because normally people don't report errors that low in the year. I see. Okay. Well, I think, I mean, I, I mean, I think that in some ways this is not like, uh, I mean, I don't know whether this is low or not. I mean, it's uh, basically, I mean, a lot of what they, a lot of what they do is they kind of build trees that are partially correct, but then they make kind of one bad inference in them. Um, and so, I mean, I think they're they're introducing a data set in their paper, and so their argument is that the data set is hard, and more people should work on it. So, um, you know, they're not claiming to to have solved it necessarily. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Let me just kind of conclude this section real quick, and then I'll pause and see if there are other questions. Um, so, uh, basically, what we showed here is that we were able to kind of start from Wikipedia and construct this uh, this training data set. Um, and then build this multi-step deduction model that can take a bunch of evidence and kind of start, uh, you know, deducing things from it. Um, so what we what I showed here is still a fairly synthetic setting where we, you know, assume we have the collection of input premises. So that's something that we want to relax. And so one of the things that we're looking at now is a model that can incorporate basically missing premises somehow. So what we do is we start from the hypothesis and we kind of work backwards and we say, okay, it looks like if we had this statement, we would have been able to prove it. But this is going to be really helpful for dealing with tasks that involve more common sense inference, where maybe not all of the premises are stated in text or available to the model. Um, and then the other thing we're looking at is how to make this a little bit more neurosymbolic. So, um, you know, maybe addressing Liang's point a little bit about, uh, you know, how can we actually ground this in uh, you know, something more like logical reasoning, we're looking at some semantic representations that might allow us to find a good middle ground there. So that was the end of the kind of major second part of the talk. So um, let me pause here and see if there's other questions at this point. So uh, if we can go back to the slide where we talk about like evaluating how far you are from the goal and you, you have, I don't know where, the, 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 yeah, some, Somewhere you have a this or maybe maybe even earlier slide that you you have a trained something yeah right here yeah somewhere you know um, yeah yeah here and you have something to evaluate your distance from the goal like maybe ah, yeah, 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 yeah 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 is that kind of like a star or inspired by a star like evaluating the the kind of heuristic future cost yeah like, I mean it's so it's not. It's not really a future cost per se. It's more like, um, I mean, uh, the way I would think about it is that we're trying to, it, it like this is a little bit more like a kind of 
uh, we're trying, like, we, we kind of assume that the things we deduce are mostly correct. And so we're trying to just kind of prove the correct statements that will allow us to get there. Um, I mean, I think you, you, you kind of can view it that way um, in that it's, it's sort of just this heuristic that guides you. There's no real like kind of forward cost function. Um, but yes, like, I mean, the idea is basically that it tells us kind of, okay, for the hypothesis, these are maybe the things that you should start combining. Yeah. So it's kind of like, like a Dijkstra or, or a star, like there's some priority going on. It's not like pure best, uh, breast first, which you have a base as a baseline, right? That's right. Yes. Right. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, I will note that, I mean, it's not, it's not a heurist. It doesn't have any of the formal properties of the A star heuristic. Like that's one of the reasons why I, I like hesitate to call it A star. Um, mm -hmm. But um, right. it's, it's yeah, the I mean, cost from the beginning, not going to cost to the end, right? In a sense, or, but. Uh, no, it is. But, I mean, it is supposed to be the cost to the end. Um, I mean, yeah. it's supposed to say basically, were, are these two sentences kind of relevant in the proof of this hypothesis, right. which it turns out is kind of hard to judge without a learned model, because mm -hmm. I mean, we have some baselines in the paper based on like word overlap, like you might think that like the two statements overlapping in words and then also overlapping with the hypothesis might be useful and that works kind of okay, but just not as well. Yeah, right. And the other question is, when do you give up like say, oh, this is not provable, I just say, no, you cannot entail that or is right now, it's just a timeout, basically. Like, uh, we yeah. search for a fixed number of steps. Um, so, it, I mean, yeah, like, you know, the, the entailment bank data set is fairly simple, I guess. Like, a lot of things are combining just, like, three to five facts. Um, and so the search right. is not that deep. Um, I think we, what, we're, what, we're, what we're trying to do right now is kind of figure out settings that have deeper trees that you're trying to build, which I think can help stress test these algorithms more. Right. So this is related to like a theorem proving literature, right? Where they do what search for 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 proof tree for for like geometry geometry theorems, right? So yeah. Is there any related work that are kind of like this that you you, you have some connection there, or? Yeah, I mean, so I think the um, so yeah. First of all, I'll mention that the, our our uh, collaborator Swarat Chowdhury on this um, comes from right. the PL and formal methods community. So, right, he, um, he and I you know, overlapped. Uh, we, we did the PhDs around the same time. He, he came from Penn, so I, I actually oh. know him. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so I mean, uh, I definitely think that like uh, I so uh, like the so the answer is yes. Like uh, we definitely want to. Uh, we want to kind of learn how to, uh, you know, kind of build these paths out in the in the best way possible. I think that right for right now, you know, there's just such there. First of all, there's such a high cost, and second of all, there's like so much to evaluate and kind of figure out ar around the kind of single steps here. That I think the challenges of the things like geometry proofs and like how to do search there. I mean, the kind of their search space is here and our search space is kind of over here in terms of the challenges. So um, I think the algorithms for right now still look pretty different, um, but I think we like absolutely want to get to the point where um, we're kind of borrowing from that literature and, and being able to integrate those kind of techniques. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Overall, it's super exciting that you're doing this. It's very unique that nobody else is doing. Very nice. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I, I will say that, uh, I mean, the other group that uh, is kind of working on sort of related stuff is Pete Clark's group from AI2. Um, I mean, I think like basically we like our approach better <laughs> better than theirs, um, which is where that kind of end-to-end -end model came from. But um, yeah, Kai is interning with them this summer. So we'll probably have some convergence, yeah. Uh, hello. I'm a little confused about the statement that the uh, search and the deduction process are decoupled. Is the searching mm -hmm. process chained along with the deduction process or performed manually? So the, good question, yeah. So these are not trained kind of jointly at all. Like the deduction model, I, I talked about what the data looks like for that earlier. That was, um, you know, that was kind of this, uh, where is it? That, that, that was kind of this data, right? Um, so that's where the deduction model is trained from. Um, and then the, uh, search model is trained from this supervised entailment bank data set. Um, and so that's just basically a uh, classification model that looks at a pair of sentences in a hypothesis. It's also not optimized end to end on this. So they really are different models that are doing different things. And the deduction model 
kind of has no knowledge of the hypothesis. That's really the big distinction here. So how do you get the supervision of the session process? Yeah, so that relies on this entailment bank data set, which actually has annotated full trees for this. So it's a pretty small data set. It's only about a thousand trees. And um, I think they say in the paper, it took like 600 hours to collect or something like that. So it's a very expensive data to collect. Um, so we kind of use that small data to learn this heuristic. And then we use our bigger data set to learn the deduction model. Okay, I see. So, uh... How to apply this, this model to mm, inference data, which we don't have the reason to pass. Yeah. We don't have the, um, such a pass, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think, uh, so I guess there's a, I have a couple answers. One is that, you know, we can try transferring a model from this task and kind of see how it works in other settings. Um, so we've been looking at some new domains and, you know, found kind of, you know, some success with that, but also some challenges. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think the other thing is that if we kind of find a setting like that, we can start to explore some different heuristics, like, you know, stuff kind of in between breadth first and this full learned thing, like, are there better, um, you know, ways of kind of learning to search? Or again, this gets to Liang's question about, um, you know, uh, kind of, kind of uh, yeah. can we use techniques from like, theorem proving literature and um, yeah, like uh, I don't have answers for that yet, but I think it's a great question. Okay, thank you. Great job. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess uh, Ping, what, uh, how are we on time? Uh, when should I plan to finish up by? Uh, I think you have uh, 90 minutes over uh, in total. so. So up okay. to you how you want to divide the time, yeah. Okay, all right, yeah. So I'll go through this, I'll go through this last section then. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, this will be shorter than that middle section, but um, yeah. Uh, so basically with our kind of focus here on generation for these kind of deduction models, um, I think kind of thinking about text generation and, and better techniques is gonna be important. So this was some work uh, led by my student, uh, Jiaxiang Xu, um, which is going to be presented at NACL. Um, and so to, to kind of illustrate that, I mean, in these deduction models, we have kind of pairs of sentences and there are many different uh, kind of valid inferences we could conclude from them, even valid and useful inferences. So for example, here, uh, we could generate an output that kind of focuses on the impact on an ecosystem or the impact on organisms. Um, and so we don't know which ones of these are useful. Ideally, we would like to have as many generation candidates as possible and let the search procedure sort it out. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, a, you know, a kind of algorithm for trying to do this. This was stuff that we developed in the context of summarization and translation. Um, so we're gonna kind of depart from the, the reasoning here, but I'll, I'll kind of bring it back to that at the end, um, you know, once I've, I've kind of shown you the algorithm. Um, so I think summarization is a problem that has a somewhat similar flavor in the sense that there's a lot of different possible summaries of a document that all might be good. Um, so uh, in this case, the input document's not too important, so I'm not gonna show it, but you know, with something like a seek to seek model, um, we can generate summaries that look like this. The smallest newspaper in the United States has won the Pulitzer Prize for journalism for the second year in a row. And we can use beam search and try to get some different outputs. Now, if you've run beam search for generation models, you, you know that you'll see stuff like this, where we get a lot of kind of shared content between them. Um, and in this case, actually, this summary is wrong. It's not the smallest newspaper in the United States. Um, and so these, these outputs are kind of overly redundant. They're not very diverse, right? Um, and the other problem is that we actually spend a fair amount of time in our search articulating and exploring other states. Like for example, um, this was a path that got pruned in beam search that the newspaper was from South Carolina, which is actually pretty useful information that maybe we would have liked to have, um, but it got eliminated uh, by pruning. So I'm gonna talk about a kind of different search procedure that uh, tries to resolve these problems and give more diverse output. Um, so the first one is that beam search has this kind of redundancy to it, right? 
Um, so we have a lot of kind of similar paths being explored where, um, you know, we have kind of variants and variations in tense and aspect, or we have, you know, awarded versus recognized kind of synonyms, similar adjectives, things like that. And so we, we spend a lot of time in the beam encoding all this similar stuff. Um, so the first thing that we, that we do here to try to make things better is to encode these hypotheses in a lattice. And so the beam state now you can think of as a collection of nodes in a search graph um, that we're going to kind of expand. And when we take a node like awarded here, Notice that awarded is actually a, a node that kind of represents several different hypotheses here. Um, and when we expand this node, we're going to make the assumption that it's continuations that we score with respect to just one of these prefixes can continue all of the prefixes so far. So this is an approximation. Um, this kind of recombination, this kind of idea uh, of basically being able to merge things is an idea from the statistical machine translation days, um, but that's been a little bit more recently explored by uh, Josung Zhang et al. Um, for, in EMNLP 2018, but um, it's not a paper that I've seen kind of widely followed up on. Um, so the idea is that we can take two hypotheses, A and B, and we can merge them if the last n tokens of these hypotheses are the same, and these are roughly the same length. So what we're assuming here is that we, if we have two prefixes, like a small newspaper was awarded and a newspaper was awarded, we're kind of assuming that the distributions over all the stuff that's going to follow these are going to be similar. We can actually evaluate this assumption kind of offline, not in the course of the algorithm. And what we found is that for these heuristics uh, in summarization models, when this heuristic applies around 70% of the time, the exact kind of greedy completion of these two summaries, these two summary prefixes will be the same. So what this kind of indicates is that these, in the, even though that these are very coarse heuristics for saying, hey, I think we're kind of in roughly the same state according to the neural model, um, they actually work reasonably well. Um, and if these distributions were to match exactly, then we could merge things in the lattice without kind of any loss of information. Um, as it is, we're, we're making an approximation, but um, it's an approximation. We'll kind of see how it works later. Okay, that's kind of one idea here, being able to build this lattice structure. Another problem is that beam search just somehow isn't the right thing for diverse generation, because as you go through the beam search process, you start to lose a lot of hypotheses that were initially very promising. Um, so for example, this yesterday, a small item in the third beam here just doesn't survive into the fourth beam. It gets crowded out by these other things. Um, and so these blue things like are actually could be fine summaries if we just continued them to the end. Um, they're not really inherently worse and they're not even that much lower scoring than the things at the very top. Um, so, Basically, we, we pruned around five of the 12 states that we explored here, and you know, we'd like to instead keep them around. So here's how we do that. So we restructure the order of the search. So we're not using dream search anymore. Instead, we're using a kind of hybrid of best first search and depth first search. So what we do is we start from the start of the sentence, um, and we expand things uh, by order of model score. So we start with a here, which has the, the highest model score under the, uh, you know, under the pre-trained model. And we, uh, then we get a, a bunch of possible successors. And what we do is we kind of greedily follow the first one all the way until we reach an EOS token. So this kind of guarantees that we're getting a finished summary as quickly as possible, right? Because we're basically doing a greedy pass. Then what we do is we go back through and in kind of a best first fashion, we say, okay, what's our next highest scoring thing? Let's expand that. Um, so we go back and now we're gonna revisit the, the here. Okay, so what happens is then we start running this expansion and we combine this with the hypothesis recombination. So now as we start expanding along this path, we say, oh, okay, the smallest newspaper was, and now the model wants to say awarded next. And 
This leads to a kind of match according to this recombination criterion and we can merge these states. So now we go back, we pick up the next highest scoring thing and we, we keep generating. So the kind of overall algorithm here does this kind of de these depth first passes and then goes back and kind of picks the next thing to, to explore. Um, but it kind of very quickly identifies areas of redundancy and so starts merging these paths. And so what this yields as the output is a lattice that encodes a lot of possible generation options. Um, and so what we get something that looks kind of like this, and I'll just zoom in on one part of it to show what kind of structures can be encoded here. Um, so this is a story about how Apple misled Australian consumers over its new iPad. And so um, in the lattice here, uh, we see that we, you know, Apple misled Australian consumers or Australians or about or over its or the new iPad. So we actually encode quite a number of sort of paraphrases of, of this that normally would be different beam items in this very compact way. Okay, so how can we understand what this data structure can do for us? I mean, it's this, it's this big lattice that encodes a lot of possibilities, right? So one thing we can do, and that's shown in the top left here, is just say how many paths are in this lattice. Um, so uh, we can compare to beam search and kind of things like dynamic beam search. And we have comparisons to nucleus sampling in the paper. Um, and we, we also compare to that uh, prior uh, algorithm of Jisong Zhang et al. Um, and we find that our recombination approach produces things that are kind of roughly twice as big. Um, and with a kind of variant of our approach, we get something that's even bigger. Now, what I'm showing on the bottom here is the Oracle Rouge over the lattice. And so we're using this as a kind of proxy for quality. Essentially, if the lattice is encoding a lot of really good options, then it should be possible to find some path that has a very high or at least higher Oracle Rouge because we're encoding something that looks closer to the gold summary. So the big question here then is, okay, well, you're encoding all of these paths, you know, and but you said you were making an approximation. Right. Um, so how do we know that this is reliable? And so um, one of the things we looked at was just the fraction of grammatical errors that we see in paths that we get. Um, and so the nice thing is that uh, so this is judge using Gector, which is a state of the art grammatical error correction model. Um, and the the kind of fraction here is like the percentage of tokens that have a grammatical error. So it's a very small, it's like 0.8% or something like that. So um, compared to these past approaches and, and also compared to nucleus sampling, which is not shown, the there, there aren't as many kind of new grammatical errors as you might think, given that we're kind of a, recombining these things in this approximate way. Um, when we use the more aggressive version, it does introduce a few more errors, but um, you know that's kind of the trade-off we're seeing here. So the kind of general hypothesis of this line of work, I think, is that our generation systems actually encode lots of good options already. Um, we want to be able to find them and surface them. And so our goal uh, kind of going forward is to say, all right, now that we have all these options, can we build something like a re-ranker that can pull out the best uh, the, the best outputs here? Or can a user do something like kind of interactively you know, work with the system to build a generation output, which we then, you know, do something like learn corrections from um, as it's kind of changing the system output or something like that. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're interested in looking at this for improving factuality of summarization. And um, that's another um, thread that my uh, group has worked on. My student Tanya Goyle has done uh, some work on that that we'd like to combine with uh, these sorts of approaches. Um, controllable dialogue generation, diverse paraphrasing, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, we think these can possibly be useful for. Um, and kind of bringing it back to the idea of deduction, uh, I think that if we can use something like this and get the space of actually valid inferences we can build in natural language and then combine that with some of these better proof search techniques, we can actually um, you know, kind of really take this stuff to the next level. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of briefly wrap up and then we can return to this part or any of the other parts of the talk for questions. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I kind of motivated all of this as uh, kind of doing reasoning in natural language. And so I think there's some really exciting applications that this is going to enable us to deal with that haven't been possible um, with some of the past techniques. 
so for example, uh, automatic fact checking uh, is something where uh, we often have these kind of very complex claims that involve reasoning about multiple pieces. Um, so there's some past work from Angela Fan et al. Uh, from Meta about decomposing these into multiple pieces. And so one thing that we're looking at is then, um, which is kind of not covered in their work, is being able to take these different pieces and then synthesize conclusions from them and then either kind of prove or, or uh, contradict claims. Um, so that's one kind of application that we foresee for this. Um, in another line of work, we've been looking at reasoning about entities. Um, so this is work uh, led by my student Yasumasa, uh, where we collected a data set um, called Creek of uh, claims that involve both definitional knowledge about entities and then also common sense inferences. Um, and so pre-trained models do kind of okay at this task, still not quite human level, but they do pretty reasonably. Um, but one thing we'd really like to be able to do is to kind of materialize all of the reasoning along the way. Um, and so we haven't kind of seen it applied for this data set yet, but I think one of the related ideas I talked about earlier in this uh, talk was these chain of thought models, which have uh, kind of come out and recently been popularized with the Palm uh, paper. So um, I think one thing that we're kind of seeing there is the ability of pre-trained models to make these kinds of inferences in natural language and kind of generate the, this kind of relevant supporting information, which I think is a really cool capability that can help us tackle these more complex problems. Um, so, you know, hopefully I've kind of convinced you that there's some merit to this direction. And I think that, uh, you know, kind of like a lot of things in NLP, this is kind of banking on generation models getting bigger and better as we uh, proceed over the next few years. And so, um, you know, I think to the extent that there's still errors in this stuff and things like that, um, you know, hopefully with the next round of bigger models and as we figure out how to scale things up more, we'll be able to uh, address some of those and make it work even better and kind of deliver on this vision here. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Thanks so much for your attention. Um, and I just want to acknowledge my uh, collaborators on this work, um, all my wonderful colleagues at UT, um, as well as our funding sources. Thanks. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, this is a wonderful talk. Uh, now, I, I now remember, like not too long ago, Dan Roth from the University of Pennsylvania gave us a talk. Uh, the title is, uh, It's Time for Reasoning. Yeah, yep. <laughs> I, I think I've seen that exact talk probably when he visited uh, UT as well. But uh, yeah, um, no, I mean, I think like Dan and I, you know, are, are, you know, reasonably well aligned. I think some of our techniques differ a bit, but on the ideas of kind of building kind of explainable models and articulating all this intermediate reasoning stuff, I think absolutely the goals are similar. Yeah. Wonderful. So this is an excellent opportunity for the audience to ask some questions. Any questions? Okay, yeah. so, okay. Hi. Uh, so, so uh, can I ask a question about the last part? Uh, you know, sure, the beam yeah. Space decoding. Yeah. So, so as you know, I've done a lot of work on that uh, yep. in that area, <laughs> and <laughs> so it's, yeah. So there is a paper uh, also uh, that one of my papers uh, also in EMLP twenty eighteen. I realized I had the same idea as the paper you cited uh, from uh, Jisong. Uh, John or something. Uh, we yeah, I, yeah, just some look at that paper and, and realized that, that we had the same idea of uh, combining uh, hypothesis during beam search. And, and that's actually a, a classical technique uh, from statistical yeah. machine translation that I developed uh, uh, along with others called Kupruni. So we call our paper Kupruni. Yeah. And uh, those authors uh, you cited did not know about the, that literature of Kupruni, uh, so they didn't, they didn't cite us. Um, so, I mean, meaning my earlier, even earlier work. Uh, but anyways, uh, so the idea is quite similar. And when you combine stuff uh, and you, uh, like you have a, one of the next slides, you have, um, if you can move on to the next slide, you combine stuff and emerge. Yeah, and when you you say, oh, I use, I use one hypothesis as the representative to uh, keep going, right? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. but, but yeah. Because, because the uh, neural models are, uh, Different from engram models in the sense that they they have full memory of the whole history, so they can remember every single bit of the whole history being slightly different from uh, when you merge two paths, right? So when you going forward, sometimes you have yes. to un unpack a little bit because they they have different because the earlier differences make make uh, may may make a difference in later stages. 
so, but but of course, your your solution is even nicer in the sense that you can do lattice and uh, and and recombine and and also probably unpack. Yeah. So so here's the question. So when you you have walls going to a wall has was already developed to something else uh, to the right, uh, but when was is remerging to award it, so you probably will have some new hypothesis uh, building up, right? Yeah. So so a couple of things. Yeah. First of all, yeah. I mean, I I I, I actually started my PhD on uh, uh, machine translation and looked at a lot of like the cube pruning stuff back in like 2010. So I mean, I think that the like in the cube there you have like the rules. And then the two um, kind of states of the hypergraph, right? This was in like Hiro style um, mm -hmm. MT thing. So yeah. yeah, this one is, I mean, this is kind of the simpler, just kind of like linear um, form of it rather than the hypergraph version. But um, mm -hmm. yes. yeah, I mean, I think that, so the basic, the, the basic kind of assumption we get into here is that um, these, uh, Let's see, the cursor doesn't want to show up, but that's fine. Um, so in the where where it says like minus 1.8 and the dot dot dot, like what we assume is that all of those things that kind of complete a newspaper was awarded are also going to have reasonably high score under the smallest newspaper was awarded, mm -hmm. blah blah blah. Uh-huh. I see. Um, so this was this was something that we kind of spent some time checking. Um, mm -hmm. Like uh, on this slide, this that's this whole kind of seventy percent of the time the greedy completion is the same. Um, mm -hmm. I think so. If you're doing something like story generation, I don't mm -hmm. think this generally holds, right? Like like basically this criterion about the kind of n-gram matching is too weak. Um, you know, you're you're gonna have a story about like you know you know, Greg did such and such and, and Liang did such and such. And then there's just some, you know, shared, like gave a talk and Graham and then suddenly like these two different things are merged. So it doesn't work. Um, I think it works in scenarios like this and machine translation because the input is relatively constrained by, or sorry, the decoder outputs are relatively constrained by the input that you're given. Um, so mm -hmm. that's why we're able to kind of just sort of make this this connection here without like doing a detailed like check every new path that was introduced or something which would be um you know which would generally be pretty slow um to do yes yes yeah and it's great that you're doing lattice uh because lattice is is a concept that is largely forgotten in nlp uh so so i have some uh work around that uh, 2018, 2019 time using lattice for like machine translation hypothesis because you have you know, multiple hypotheses for evaluating like blue scores then you can, but, but in, in, in reality, in, in, like um, ideally you want like millions of alternatives like because the, the space of possible reference translations are yeah. so, so, so big, right? So I, I use the lattice that as you showed later in this slide to, to kind of capture a larger space of possible references, which is also related to your work. Anyways, uh, very nice ideas. And I'm glad you're using this uh, classical idea, redeveloping this classical ideas from um, old days to, to the new neural world. And thanks. Yeah. yeah. And uh, let me, uh, yeah, I, I can look it up afterwards, but also if you want to send me an email about yeah, the, I'll send you emails uh, about my related 18 work. Yeah. Paper. Yeah. yeah, I could share with that way, I can share with Josh Young as well. Because, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Leon. So there's a question from the chat box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, can the path three combination benefit the sampling based decoding? Yeah. So that's a great that's a great question. I mean, I think that what we were trying to do here. So okay. So one of the issues I, I didn't include the nucleus sampling results in this slide. They're they're in the paper, but um, basically the kind of errors from nucleus sampling are like reasonably high. So I think. Summarization is in this kind of weird middle ground where like um, for story generation, everyone just uses nucleus sampling, right? Like beam search just falls into these kind of degenerate modes because the, the distribution of stories is so flat. Um, summarization, I think, has this property where like it's kind of a, I don't know, a mesa. I don't know what you would call the, <laughs> the geographic feature exactly. But like, you know, um, there's kind of many uh, summaries that are all like reasonably good. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to explore those. However, if you do something like nucleus sampling, you're likely to draw something that's just like a little too unlikely. And so you're likely to introduce errors or kind of get into a weird part of the state space. So I think this is kind of specifically targeting these settings like, like this machine translation, um, you know, this deduction stuff where there's maybe several possible 
good outputs, um, but it's not quite as sort of unbounded in what you can do as uh, as story generation. So um, yeah, so I mean, I think you can still potentially combine it. Um, and we, I think we even have a version that uses nucleus sampling and recombination. Um, the problem is just that because the samples are so different, they usually don't end up being able to, to recombine, at least not with the like amount of, or with the kind of number of steps that we were running in the search. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like theoretically they can be uh, put together. So great question. I agree. I have a question about the, um, the latent language inference for question answer and verify okay. prediction. So for that one, I just wonder if for latent language inferences, you train the model actually use some annotated corpus, right? But if we want to do something like uh, and, and given some, some corpus uh, without any annotation, can we get some and like a self supervised supervised way to generate some large language inferences to help with the question answer. And you that way we don't need some annotator, reduce the relation corpus. I mean, can get some large language inference from that. And on and just a raw text or something like that. Is that possible? Yeah. Um... I mean, I don't know. I, like, I'm not. Uh, I haven't actually. Like, my group hasn't done that much work on kind of advancing like state of the art in NLI or anything like that. So um, I guess I don't really know what from there can work or not. Um, I mean, off the top of my head, I do think that like, I mean, one, one thing that we're really kind of relying on here is for these models to be fairly precise. Like what we don't want it to do is we don't want it to just say like, yeah, these two pieces of text look similar. Sure, they're entailed, right? Like yeah. we wanted to really kind of have this high bar of like, okay, we need some evidence about plays the bad guy or like some paraphrase of that essentially. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, I, I mean, I like what I, what I will say. So, so, so basically like, I think you relying on the labeled data set of MNLI like is, is useful because it like maintains this fairly high quality bar. I will say yeah, that yeah. one of the biggest holes in this work is that, um, so GFAN did like a bunch of work on multi-hop reasoning as well. And so kind of ironically, one of the holes of, in this work is it doesn't handle multi-hop uh, stuff very well. Um, mm -hmm. And one thing it kind of can't do, or these NLI models are not good at is taking multiple sentences as input and then kind of judging a hypothesis based on those. So um, I think that's something that it would be nice if we could, build an NLI model that uh, that actually does that and using techniques yeah. maybe like the ones you're suggesting here. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not aware of anything that really shows that that works yet. Okay, okay, I see. I just also I uh, want, because of now prompt learning is very popular now. So I just uh, maybe we can use some prompt learning technique to help us to do uh, uh, such uh, language inferences or something. Yeah. Do you think? Uh, yeah. Possibly, I mean, uh, like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know about, I mean, I think like the prompt results on NLI are, are sort of pretty good, but not quite as good as like the sort of biggest, like deeper to discriminative models fine tuned on that data set, at least as far as I'm aware. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly for, I mean, certainly for all of the stuff I talked about in, in you know, in kind of uh, this part of the talk, like we've been looking at using GPT-3 for this um, yeah, yeah. and, you know, what, like where that, like whether that can generate data for us, you know, how it can be used, et cetera. And I mean, like, obviously it has a lot of promise. It's also very expensive to use. And so we'd like to have a smaller model that still has the mm -hmm. same capabilities. And so um, mm -hmm. we're kind of figuring out how to balance that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think your second work about the template ex expansion is kind of, and uh, just not, not not really like a prompt. I mean, just uh, use some template. The template is something like rules, right? We can help. And and it's, yeah. So the, the template expansion. So how do you do that? Just specifically. So just use some rules or some 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 format to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So this is. I mean, this is really engineered, right? So it's it's basically. Uh -huh. Uh, kind of recognizing that this sentence in the top left here captures mm -hmm. the kind of inference that we want to be able to make. 
and then we can unpack that using these syntactic rules. So I'll also acknowledge that like this worked really well for this kind of substitution reasoning pattern. And um, <laughs> we also looked at uh, some reasoning involving like contraposition. Um, mm -hmm. But we well, one thing we really wanted to be able to do was do better uh, temporal reasoning. So like mm -hmm. be able to reason about this happened earlier than this or whatever. And it was just, it was really hard to find patterns that could work there. Um, so yeah. I think there is a sort of, shortcoming where uh you like if if you can't find if you can't kind of find naturally occurring data that exhibits this stuff you you can't use this technique mm -hmm. okay very cool yeah i think your talk is very yeah covers diverse uh, area and i want to one my, a short question about a third one so for a diverse this third third, third uh, uh talk about the generation part I think that's definitely your the Nitus uh, Nitus work is very wonderful to for the diverse gener diverse diversify the generation quality, but then I just wonder if it's really helpful much on the factuality, for example, especially like a specific years or specific fact, but because fact factuality still I think it's a very big problem for the for the summarization type part, right? Yeah, do you think uh, how, how? Yeah, much so actually you, what. Yeah, one of the things that we're looking at right now, um, you know, to the extent yeah. that we can before Jia Chang graduates, but um, is that one one pattern we see is sometimes when the model is going to generate something non-factual, it it's a very high entropy point in the decision space. Mm -hmm. um, so William Wong's group, I forget who the first author is, they, they have a paper related to um, this as well, basically recognizing that kind of entropy is one thing that indicates poor factuality. Um, so one thing we're trying to identify is whether, you know, obviously like the lattice may encode some non-factual things, but can we <laughs> notice when basically there's a sort of branching path and there's like four different things that are all in conflict essentially. And then we have yeah. a sense that, okay, not all four of these things can be correct, right? And so maybe that tells us that only one of them is right or maybe none of them are right because maybe the model doesn't know, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, so I, I will read more details about your paper. So, okay, that's wonderful. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. thanks, yeah. Ting Chung. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think there's another question in the chat here. Uh, there are a lot of concept definitions and facts involved in your methodology. How do these concepts and facts organize? Facts extracted by open domain IE can help with the NLI task. Um, so I guess, uh, uh, I think there's kind of a couple answers to this. I mean, so if you're talking about just kind of the general, like, you know, we have evidence and we're trying to do reasoning about this kind of evidence and rules and stuff like that, um, then uh, I mean, I think that one thing that we, you know, what, there's, there's like one question that we haven't addressed at all is like where this knowledge comes from, right? Um, so in the AI2, this kind of science reasoning we're looking at, it all comes from a, uh, you know, it comes from this kind of curated corpus. Um, but I absolutely think that like one one place we want to take this uh, is being able to deal with kind of less curated sets of evidence, like either things from like big common sense knowledge bases, or like you said, um, facts extracted from open IE that are maybe noisy or maybe not even correct. Um, so one of the things uh, also I, I kind of briefly mentioned here was that we're kind of looking at this model that can hypothesize missing knowledge. And then one of the things we've been looking at doing with GPT-3 is saying, okay, if we hypothesize a missing fact, can we then say, okay, this fact is probably true or probably false based on like some kind of likelihood scores out of GPT-3. So um, I think the way I would say that we can kind of integrate sort of knowledge from the wild is, is something like that. And it kind of has this curation step. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of how they're organized, there's no real structure to the base of knowledge we have. It's really just like a bunch of sentences for right now. Um, but like there could definitely be some more kind of structured knowledge that the model uses, yeah. Okay, we got another one. Um, NLI task contains direction or asymmetry such as A entails B, but B cannot entail A. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's definitely a true fact about NLI. Um, does it uh, count in two segment understanding tasks when doing the heuristic search, you could measure the direction? Um, so, 
Yeah, I mean, one like so when we're doing this task, um, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understood the question, but um, when we're doing this task, we really want to like prove something that entails the hypothesis written down by a user. Um, now, if you're talking about this, this kind of heuristic, um, this is really a much kind of looser thing than entailment. It's not like uh, we know that these two statements entail this hypothesis. It's more like these two statements are kind of generally useful for getting us to this hypothesis. Um, yeah, and I mean, in the first part of the talk, again, there actually is a very clear direction here where like we've got this paragraph of known facts from Wikipedia and we want that to entail the answer we're giving the user, right? Um, so there's a, there's a kind of very clear, um, directionality there that NLI enforces, which is right for our application. Um, not sure if that answered the question, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, any any last minute question? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, really, it's almost 11 p.m. in Austin. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay, if there's no more questions, let's thank the speaker. Uh, thank you. It's a, it's a wonderful talk. Uh, we have learned a lot and we're going to learn more from your paper, from reading your papers. And uh, hopefully uh, you will be able to visit us uh, physically uh, this year or next year <laughs> or anytime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Thanks so much for inviting me. And uh, yeah, thanks for all the great questions and discussion. It was really fun. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. Okay.